mercy of your preacher would use me in spite of me. So people would be edified. And you, God, would get all of the glory. It is in the mighty and the matchless name. Christ Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior. And all God's children said amen. amen. And amen. amen. Thank you, God. Appreciative of the Spirit of God is resting in this place. Praise God for our music ministry, for how they have ushered us today into the presence of God. Amen. For the time is ours today, I'd like for us to look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Beginning in that verse 41, Mark chapter 10. <coughs> Beginning at verse 41, we're going to ask that you would, for all who are able, stand. And we will read together from the New International Version from Mark chapter 10. Beginning at verse 41. Stand together, we'll read from the screens together. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Word of God for the people of God you may be seated. The presence of God. We're going to take a few moments this morning. It's Missionary Sunday. Consider the tag this text with the topic saved to serve. Saved to serve. Saved to serve. We pick up our text this morning in the midst of a dispute between the disciples that has resurfaced from days prior. In the previous chapters, as they were walking along the road, they had been having a discussion about which of them was the greatest disciple. If we turn back just a chapter into Mark chapter 9 around verse 33, we discover that Jesus knew about this heated discussion that was taking place. In that moment, uh, they didn't respond to Jesus' um, inquiry about what they were talking about, uh, but the dispute continued. Jesus addressed for them what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. And the irony of this dispute uh, was that it was happening as Jesus was in predicting to them his death. James and John had come to, chapter, to Jesus in chapter 10 and boldly request to have seats of great honor reserved for themselves. Considering what had happened in chapter 9, this caused a point of division between the disciples. And we come to our text in verse 41, where it says that the other 10 disciples were indignant. They were mad. They were angry. They were upset with James and John. Uh, we would like to think that maybe this was because of the selfish nature of the request, but the reality is that uh, it was more than likely because James and John had asked before the other ten did. Uh, if we look at James and John's conversation with Jesus in verses 35 through 40, we quickly discover that they thought that they what they were requesting was a good thing. They thought that being in close proximity to Jesus in his glory would amount to making them great. They thought that they could get the glory that Jesus would get uh, because they had been hanging out with the Savior. Uh, but the reality is that James, John, and the other disciples were distracted by something they had no control over. The disciples wanted to be great, but they weren't considering the cost 
that was required in order to get to that place of greatness. And so Jesus has to redirect them so that they can understand the standard for greatness in the kingdom of God, which is being a servant. The reality of Christian life uh, is that it doesn't matter what position you hold, it doesn't matter what ministry you lead, it doesn't matter what influence you possess, it doesn't matter what title you may have. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never be anything more than a servant. Uh, in fact, to be a servant is the highest position in the kingdom of God. Uh, if, we threw, if we were to read throughout the narrative of the biblical witness, those uh, who are revered as the great leaders and the great heroes of the faith are always referred to as servants. Uh, Abraham was a servant. Moses was a servant. Joshua was a servant. David was a servant. The disciples were servants. Paul was a servant. And yes, the one who came down to 40 and two generations to be the savior of the world. Yes, Jesus himself was a servant. Uh, and Jesus clearly states this for us in the text. In verse 45, uh, he says this, that even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. And what is more confounding than anything is people who claim to follow Christ, who claim to be beneficiaries of the exchange of Jesus' life for our freedom from bondage, from the bondage of sin, who have specifications and limitations and ramifications for the types of service they will and won't do. Uh, if the Lord has called you to it, then you ought to go ahead and do it because of what God has already done for us. Uh, over the course of the history of the Christian faith, uh, the truth is that we've looked at salvation largely from the angle of Jesus' death being a means by which an offering was made to satisfy the consequences of the sins of humanity. And I pause right here to say that we ought not make a mistake this morning by thinking that we don't have sin because each and every person who has walked the earth, each and every person who is sitting in this sanctuary today, each and every person that's sitting in your seat wearing your shoes uh, was born with a chronic condition of sin for which the sacrifice of Jesus dying on an old rugged cross as the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world is the cure. Uh, the, this is why we as believers are covered in the blood uh, in, of Jesus. Celebrate the ordeal that he experienced because we recognize that it was done on our behalf. But the sacrifice led to the soul salvation uh, of all who would believe causing them to become a part of God's family. Uh, this comes with definitive eternal significance. It de definitely impacts our involvement in the great by and by. And so we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But the real question is for us this morning, what does that mean for our lives today? Uh, our, our eternal relationship with God has been secured, but what does that mean for our discipleship journeys in 2019 and beyond? This is where our understanding of salvation and servanthood have to be expanded and deepened so that we can have a picture of what's not just what salvation has done for us, but what salvation also requires of us. Salvation was secured by Jesus' death, but it also requires our own death. A death to our desires, death to our own way, death to our own thoughts, death to anything that is in us that is contrary to the will and the way of God. Jesus clearly taught in Luke chapter 9 uh, that anyone who would follow him would have to deny themselves and take up their cross. This means that being saved is coupled with the surrender and the submission of our own will to the will and the direction of God through Jesus Christ. In short, salvation and discipleship requires us to become servants of the one who secured our salvation. 
uh, and not just serving to the word in word, but serving to the daily actions uh, and activities that we participate in. And that's what both of the Greek words that I used in our text to mean servant and slave mean in verses 43 and 44. They both mean that we are no longer our own. We don't belong to ourselves. We are now uh, under the control of the heavenly Savior, of our heavenly Father, and our Savior Jesus Christ. We exist to serve the greater purpose of God, our Father, and Christ, our Savior. We don't serve the memory of the saints who've gone on to glory before for us, uh, those folks have their place. We might place them on a pedestal, our mamas and our grandmamas, daddies and uncles and granddaddies, but at the end of the day, uh, they didn't die for us. They exposed us to Christ, but they didn't secure our salvation. There are too many of us that claim to serve God, but we are only serving the will of someone else because we haven't taken the time to learn what the Lord requires of our lives. There are too many folks who claim to be servants, but the actions of their lives, the actions of their lives only point to doing what is in their best interest. It doesn't matter to them what God says because they don't want to follow the direction and the mission that God has set before him. And before we start looking around, uh, pointing at other folks across the sanctuary, before we start looking around, talking about, oh yeah, I know they need to hear that over in the annex. I, I know they need to hear that in the main sanctuary. Uh, we might want to pull home the mirror up to ourselves uh, and look at ourselves first to see uh, if we have been living obedient to the will of God. And I guarantee you that from the pulpit up to the street curb, we need to check our allegiances and how surrendered we have been living to what God has directed us to do. Verse 45 this morning is pivotal to our understanding of what Jesus instructs the disciples to do in the verses that come before it. Uh, Jesus came to lay down his life in exchange for our sins. Jesus came as a servant submitted to the will of God, but the disciples were distracted by arguing about which of them was the greatest. Uh, I've always found it interesting in the text uh, that Jesus doesn't kill their desire to be great. Uh, he just reframes the discussion from a kingdom perspective. Uh, and for many of us, we need a constant reframing of our perspective on what it means to be saved and to be a servant. Uh, we weren't saved to stay the same or to sit passively waiting to reach the great by and by. Yes, we want to all get to that golden shore. We want to all spend eternity uh, worshiping and praising our Lord and our Savior. Uh, but there's some stuff we got to do right now. Uh, the gift of our salvation is uh, secured by the greatest servant ought to move us into serving God's way. Uh, we, Because we have been saved, we should serve. There ought not be any more bench warmers. We should not have some pew sitters. Uh, there ought to be no more spectators to the work of the kingdom that is happening right before us. No more folks uh, trying to change the play calls in the huddle to suit their own agenda and their own desires. It's time for us to learn and to trust God enough to follow God's will and to follow God's way when it comes to every aspect of our individual lives in the collective life of our church. Uh, so what then does the text show us about what it means to be saved uh, to serve? Uh, I've raised two points this morning. The text uh, helps us with today. The text first shows us that being saved to serve means serving from a with a different perspective of power. Serving with a different perspective on power. Uh, check the text, verse 42. Jesus calls the disciples together it points to the example of service that they are used to seeing in the world. Uh, he says, those regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, uh, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Uh, the notion of Gentile rulers lording their position over people really means that they were dominating the people with their power and authority. Uh, in other words, they used their power to hold other people down and get the best of people. Uh, this was a major thing in their day because the Roman Empire's oppressive taxes and policies that made poor people even poorer, sounds familiar, uh, seemed to take whatever they wanted whenever they wanted. 
of their domination was a show of forceful power that wasn't connected with anything but preserving and solidifying their own power. Uh, and even in our world today, we can see this dynamic at work in each and every day on our jobs and our government and in our communities. The world ascribes power to those who are able to dominate, particularly when imposing their will in, uh, in oppressing others. We can, we can look at the situations that are happening even in our national government today as a great example. Y'all know the Supreme Court just passed a, uh, just, uh, passed a ruling that says that Jerry Gerrymandered voting according to political party is cool, uh, and gerrymandered voter, voter districts and other voting restrictions serve as a way for power to be controlled by a particular group of people uh, without consideration of the needs of the marginalized of the country. Uh, these are public servants who seek to serve themselves. There is no care, there's no comparison for the everyday people, only concern for holding on to power for the powerful. Uh, this is the way the world works and we have to be mindful of that this perspective and approach doesn't infiltrate and become the norm of Christian life and our churches. And when it shows up, y'all, we have to call it out and cast it out with boldness. Uh, the disciples were thinking like the Gentile rulers, not, uh, not Christ followers. So he continues in verse 43 to tell them, uh, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Uh, what's interesting here in the text is the phrase, not so with you. Uh, then this is a clue that the disciples, uh, to the disciples and to us, that there ought to be something different about us and the way we move and behave in the world. Uh, because the disciples had been with Jesus, they were expected to be different than everyone else. But they had grasped it, but their view on power should be different than what they had experienced in their everyday lives. And the reality is that if we are going to be the blood-washed believers that we claim to be, if we are the disciples of Christ that we claim to be, we have to have a different perspective on power than the rest of the world and allow that perspective to be the driver for how we live our lives in faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the new perspective on power is one that doesn't thrive on stripping power from others, but it thrives on doing all we can to empower uh, listen to how uh, Jesus describes this in the text. In order to be uh, great, you must become a servant. Uh, in order to become first, you must be slave of all. In other words, true power doesn't come from being the boss. It comes from being the servant. Uh, true power doesn't come out of getting your way, but it comes out of putting your weight to the side in order to submit to the will of another. Uh, in Martin Luther King's famous sermon, The Drum Major uh, Instinct, he says it like this, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You only need your heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Being a servant is what makes us great, not being a ruler. How we submit to the will of God and how willing we are to lay down our lives uh, for the betterment of other folks is the key to releasing the transforming power of God's love and the kingdom of God in our loves and in our lives and in the world because we will only be following the pattern that Christ has set before us. The text shows us uh, that being safe to serve means we have to have a different perspective on power. Look, I'm done. This is for today. Uh, safe, being safe to serve also means allowing our service to shift the culture. Allowing our service to shift uh, the culture. Check the text. Verse 43 begins again with this significant phrase. Not so with you. Uh, uh, in this simple phrase, Jesus gives a view for what our lives as Christian servants should do. Uh, in verse 42, Jesus describes one kind of culture. And then in verse 43, he describes a completely different kind of culture. Uh, and Jesus juxtaposes these two different perspectives on power. 
Uh, what, one culture says, what can I get? The other culture says, what can I give? One culture says, how can you serve me? Uh, the other culture says, how can I serve you? Uh, and it turns on this phrase, not so with you. Uh, not only is he telling the disciples that they should be different, but he is giving them a view into how they will impact the culture that is around them. Uh, and perhaps as Christian disciples, we need to reconnect with the idea that we are called to be culture changers. Uh, we serve a Savior whose goal was to shift the spiritual and social culture for humanity. Everywhere he showed up, things started moving because he was submitted in service to God. But uh, he didn't keep that power to himself or for himself. He shared that authority with us. And he has given us a pathway to access it. Uh, that is by being servants who seek the will of God and the good of others over our own will and our own good. Uh, when Jesus says, not so with you, he is talking not just to the disciples, but he is talking to all of the yous that are sitting in here today. Uh, you shouldn't be like the world. You shouldn't dominate others with the power you think you have. You shouldn't seek to manipulate folks to your will. Uh, you uh, shouldn't be so selfish. You shouldn't be so self-seeking. You shouldn't put F up yourself above everyone else. You shouldn't switch out your will for God's will. Uh, instead, you should follow the way of Christ. You should seek to empower others with the power you have. You should find ways to partner with one another to build God's kingdom. You should be selfish. You should be following the word, the way, and the will of God. You should be a servant who is submitted to God's will. You should do all that you can so that you can shift the culture of your home, shift the culture of your church, shift the culture of your job, shift the culture in your community, and shift the culture in the world. We can show that picture. We can show that picture. Uh, there, there is a concept of leadership that is known as the inverted pyramid. It's right here uh, on, on the screen. This, this is a concept that uh, flips the traditional notion uh, of the leader at the pinnacle and the po power hierarchy of an organization and places the leader at the bottom. You see uh, one pyramid with a single point at the top has the leader uh, that's at the top and the followers at the bottom. But you notice uh, the other pyramid is flipped upside down so that the followers are at the top, the followers are at the pinnacle, and the leader is at the bottom. Uh, the idea is that instead of everything going to the will of the leader, the leaders serve to support the employees, the volunteers, the audience, or the customer base of the organization. Uh, one company that uses this real uh, a whole lot as their uh, organizational model is Home Depot. Uh, and the founders of Home Depot, Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank, he, here's what they have to say about the concept. Uh, the people at the stores are the most important after customers because they interface with the customer. And since Bernie and I couldn't begin to tell you how to wire your house, we are the least important in satisfying a customer. We want everybody to know uh, that we are here to support the stores. In our inverted management structure, everyone's career depends on how the associates in the stores function. We don't care what your job is, uh, you have a role, and if you don't think you do, then you don't belong here. If you don't know what your role is, then you need to find out. Uh, and I would submit to you today, my brothers and sisters, uh, that if we are going to live as witnesses to the message of the gospel, if we are going to be agents of soul salvation, if we are going to shift the culture of our church and our community and our city and our country and our world, then we have to take on the mindset of the servant. Yeah, I know you've been working so hard to climb the ladder to get to the top because you thought the top was in the pulpit. You thought the top was being a deacon. You thought the top was being a trustee. But all I'm telling you today is that you need to serve right where you are and let God worry about all that title stuff. You just do what the Lord has called you to do and let God handle all that other stuff. <clears throat> when we show the world, when we flip the world's a way of doing things on its head, we 
show uh, the world a different way of doing things. And that's what the church is us all about. It's about showing the world a different way, a different way to lead, a different way to love, a different way to change lives, a different way to transform. They ought to be able to look uh, no further than the lives of those who have been saved by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And this is what Jesus has done for us. Y'all, when he got up on that cross, he flipped the culture. So now, serving equals power. Uh, yes, they thought they had him dead to rights. They thought that it made him weak by nailing him to that cross. But what they did is allow him to get to the next level of his power so that he could empower us to do the work that we are called to do. He, he, he died on that cross. And then he got up on that Sunday with resurrection power. And guess what? It's that same resurrection power that empowers our lives every day. But we have to be willing to do it the way Jesus did. Not looking to serve our own wills. Not looking to do it the way we want to do it. But getting on our knees and praying and asking God to show us the way. Reading our word and asking the Spirit to reveal to us how we should live, how we should move. Asking the Spirit to walk with us each and every day to make the right decisions, to go the right direction, to serve uh, in a way that shows the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus has empowered us to be on the front lines of change, to shift the culture so that the ways of the kingdom can expand into all of the world. And that's what he said, go ye therefore into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. One thing I learned about teaching is that sometimes you teach people by just doing stuff. But as they, as you watch, them, as they watch you, they will see you doing it different. And they'll be like, what does that person got that I don't have? What's going on in their life that's not going on in my life? And then they want to know all about that Jesus and that God that you serve. And when we need to be reminded about what a servant looks like, we don't have to look any further than the greatest servant of all time, Jesus Christ, who Paul wrote being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God to be something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, made himself in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to God, even unto death. Yes, death on a cross. And that's why even today, 2,000 years later, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, not just on the earth, but below the earth and above the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is a Lord to the glory of God, our Father. And because Jesus has saved us, now it's our turn to walk in the power of Christ and serve God. It's our turn to serve other people. It's our turn uh, to do what God has called us to do so that the will of God can be done uh, in our lives. Is there anybody in here today that's glad uh, that Jesus didn't just die to save them from their sin, but save them to put them into the action. Save them so that they might serve God's people and build the kingdom of God. We've been saved to serve. No, it's something you can do. It's something, it's something you can do to help build God's kingdom. You ought to pray and ask the Lord, well, what can I do? Uh, I don't want to be a pew sitter anymore. I don't want to be a bench one. I, I need to get into churches. How can I live out this faith when I go to my job? How can I live out this faith everywhere I go? Uh, so that people can see that Jesus is real and they can recognize the power and the love of God through our lives. Come on, let's stand. That's all for today. That's all we got. We've been saved to serve. We've been saved not just to be saved, but we've been saved to do something. And that is to be the witness of Christ in the world. And so we want to invite somebody today uh, who needs to connect their life with Jesus Christ. Um, because you recognize that there is something happening, there's something uh, that's missing, there's something that's not quite right uh, in your life. We want to invite you today uh, to come and connect your life with Jesus Christ. Uh, we want you to come and 
and, and, and give your life to Christ today. Perhaps the Lord has been speaking to you uh, along these lines. The Lord has been sharing and telling you uh, and, and whispering to you. Now is the time. Today is your day. Come on. Uh, we'd love to welcome you into the family of God today. Uh, here's the good news. It's as simple as ABC. And then uh, that you are a sinner. Believe that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. Confess Jesus as the Lord and the leader of your life. Uh, not just the Lord, Lord and lead us in a synonym. That means that Jesus is now in charge. That's, that's what happens. That you are submitting your control and your will unto the Lord. And so we invite you to come today. Come uh, and connect your life with Jesus Christ. Uh, perhaps you've been walking along the way, but at some point in time, you wrestled the control back uh, of, of your life from God. You started doing things your own way, uh, but now you desire to reconnect uh, and recommit your life and rededicate your life to God. We invite you to come. Uh, come on, we'll pray with you. Uh, we'll help you to get started on the right track. And here's the, here's the good news. Maybe you don't want to do it here. Maybe you don't want to stay here. That's cool because we're going to find, help you find a place that's going to help you to grow. Uh, we want to help you to be your very best self. Ain't no competition uh, in the kingdom here. There's no competition uh, between churches over here. We're not competing with Cedar Street or 31st or St. Paul's or anybody. We are about the building the kingdom of God. And we play a small part here at Mount Carmel Church along with all the other churches that are doing the will of the Lord. And so we invite you to come for rededication. Uh, uh, perhaps finally we want to invite you to come uh, so that you might connect your gifts, connect your life uh, with us here at the Mount Carmel Church. I'd love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your family. We'd love to walk along and grow with you in this season of your life. Won't you come and worship with us? Won't you come and fellowship with us? Won't you come and partner your gifts with us? The choir's uh, going to sing, but as the Spirit moves on your heart, we invite you uh, to come. The deacons are coming. The deacons are walking the aisles. They'll walk with you. If you just want to raise your hand, if you uh, don't feel comfortable walking up on your own, we invite you to come on up and be a part 